the report card where we evaluate efforts to improve the lives of families, schools, and students. In most American schools, students are taught to read by prioritizing the acquisition of skills over the acquisition of knowledge. For instance, teachers might emphasize students' ability to find the main idea in a passage without necessarily focusing on the underlying content in the passage. This approach has an appeal, right? Give a man a fish and you feed him for a day, teach him how to fish, and you feed him for a lifetime. But when it comes to reading, what if that's wrong? What if content or knowledge is more important than practice by teachers in schools would suggest? This is what Natalie Wexler argues in her new book, The Knowledge Gap. She not only claims that knowledge is more important than we've been giving credit for, She's suggesting that the achievement gap that education reformers have tried to fix for decades with accountability, testing, additional funding, that it may come down to a knowledge gap. Joining Natalie, we have asked Ashley Berner, who's the deputy director of the John Hopkins Institute for Education Policy and has been working on this knowledge gap problem to talk to us about the book. Ashley and Natalie, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Glad to be here. So, Natalie... Explain to us, what is this knowledge gap? Right. Well, it's a kind of a play on the phrase achievement gap, or sometimes it's called opportunity gap. And I would say it's basically a test score gap. And it's basically the gap in test scores between kids from the higher end of the socioeconomic scale and the lower end. And that gap, as you mentioned, has been with us for a long time. It Depending on which group of scholars you talk to, it either hasn't budged in 50 years or it's gotten significantly larger. But best case scenario is we haven't made progress. And I think, as you mentioned, you know, we've been looking at this gap as though it were a gap in skills. And when we're talking about reading, specifically reading comprehension skills like the ones you mentioned, but there are skills and then there are quote unquote skills. So there are some skills like riding a bike or or decoding words, you know using phonics to sound out words, that you practice and you get better at and you can teach them directly and without any particular context. But these reading comprehension skills are not directly teachable, generally applicable skills like that. Cognitive scientists have known for decades that the most important factor in whether you can understand what you're reading is how much knowledge and vocabulary you have relating to the topic. So, for example, kids who know a lot about baseball if they're given a passage to read about baseball, and this is a study that was done in the late 80s, the kids who knew a lot about baseball were able to understand that passage very well, regardless of whether they had tested as good or poor readers on a standardized reading test. And the kids who didn't know much about baseball all tested pretty low, regardless of how they tested on a standardized reading comprehension test. So what schools have done, especially in the last 20 years, as reading tests have become so much more important and the yardstick against which we're really measuring academic progress is, they well, they first of all look at the tests. Those tests seem to be testing those skills, finding the main idea, making inferences. So they've doubled down on teaching those skills. And subjects like social studies and science have gotten marginalized in the curriculum, especially at the elementary and sometimes middle school level, and especially in schools where test scores are low. But in fact, if you want to boost kids' reading comprehension, increase their chances of doing well on these reading comprehension tests, you should be immersing them in knowledge of the world exactly the things we've been cutting back on, social studies and science. And where this gap comes in is that children of better educated parents, and in our society that's highly correlated with higher income and more wealth, those kids pick up a lot of this kind of knowledge, academic knowledge, sophisticated vocabulary outside of school. So they start school with more of it. They continue to acquire more of it through their reading. And the other kids, who the unluckier ones, who rely on school for that kind of knowledge, if they don't get it from school, which most of them are not, they fall farther and farther behind every year. And so our efforts to narrow this gap have actually contributed to it. So let me see if I can speak back what I've heard. It seems to me that in an effort to focus on skills, you're suggesting that we've neglected to build the scaffold of information that when kids are reading, they can connect the ideas that they're dealing with and their skills aren't actually getting better because they don't have the context to employ them. Well, to some extent, yes. I mean, even toddlers can make inferences, which is a skill that is taught over and over again year after year. So it's not that they don't necessarily have those skills. Yes, sure. You don't want to just dump information on kids. You want to guide them to think about it and right. make connections. But 
That's, I would say, you know, you could phrase that as harnessing the skills to the content rather than putting the skills in the foreground. But another way of looking at it is it's just good teaching. But in any event, what you need to start with is the content, then develop the skills in tandem with delivering that information. You make a claim in the book, and you focus mostly on elementary schools, but you do make the claim that most schools don't have a knowledge-rich curriculum. Ashley, do you buy that? I do, and I like to respond in three different ways. First is an historian. So when we look at the history of pedagogy and the history of education in our country, we find, similarly with all English-speaking countries, that about 100 years ago, there was a very important debate between people who wanted to democratize the liberal arts curriculum and those who wanted to diminish the academic content of education and place an emphasis on learning how to learn and skills. That latter camp has taken many different languages and guises throughout the 20th and now 21st century, but the conflict was real And suffice it to say that those who wanted to emphasize skills over content really have dominated the 20th century, such that by the 1930s, 50% of children who were studying Latin in high school was diminishing. The access to foreign languages and great literature and so forth was less and less to be found, even at the high school level. So this is an old conflict that is now, I'm grateful to see, being revived. So that's, that's the kind of historical context. So you're saying this isn't just the common core playing out. This is not just no child left behind. This predates all these more recent notions of education. This, it does. This predates all of this. We have project-based learning, all of this going on in the 1920s, 1930s, 1940s, and so on in the English-speaking countries. But I'd also like to respond as someone who studies in international educational systems. And what we find when we look at really high-performing countries like the Netherlands or Alberta, Canada, which is one of the highest-performing systems in the world now, what they do is they require a common body of knowledge across all schools. And I will note that the Netherlands funds 36 different kinds of schools, Jewish, Catholic, socialist, Montessori, as do most democratic school systems. And because they require a common body of knowledge, at least through age 16, there's a virtuous circle going on. We know that the OECD and many other international studies show that that narrows the achievement gap between wealthy and poor kids, it also creates a teaching force that has actually learned this stuff themselves, then takes exit exams to get out of high school, and then becomes subject subject matter specialists in college. So it's a virtuous circle that most high-performing countries reinforce, and it is about knowledge. Natalie, you do a great job in the book of bringing the experience of classroom teachers and students out. You have contrasting classrooms. Can you just draw this out, what it looks like on the ground level when you have sort of knowledge-rich instruction versus sort of this more skills-based? I mean, lay it out for us. That's a good question because I think it's hard to recognize sometimes if you're in a classroom what exactly is going on. I know I was in lots and lots of classrooms and I realized once somebody explained what was going on to me, that I had no idea what I'd been looking at. So in a typical, which is is a comprehension skills focused classroom, there are basically two ways of organizing what you're going to do. One is if you have a a reading textbook called a basal reader. The other is a more seat of the pants system where the teacher is choosing commercially available children's literature to read. But either way, basically you're working on a skill of the week. The teacher models the skill like comparing and contrasting or determining the author's purpose while reading aloud and and thinking aloud. And then essentially what happens is the kids scatter into different groups and they practice 
supposedly these skills on books at their individual reading levels, which are determined by giving them essentially a, a brief reading comprehension test and seeing how many mistakes they make. And their individual reading level could be years behind their grade level. So um, they could be at a, reading at a second, what's determined to be a second grade level when they're actually in fifth or sixth grade. And this is where you get the leveled readers, right? Where you That's have right. different books at a different reading level. Many elementary parents will be familiar with yes. their kids are at level two. Right. Or... So the bright plastic baskets full of books. And those books are, again, not organized by any topic or there's no coherence to them. They've just all been determined to be at the same level of complexity, which is determined really by sentence length and, you know, word length and things like that. So there's no effort to build any particular knowledge. And there's no effort to match kids to subjects that they might have knowledge about, which, as we know from that baseball study I mentioned, if they have some background knowledge of a topic, they're likely going to be able to read at a higher level. But there's no provision for that. So essentially what that amounts to is a tracking system in elementary school. And those kids who were relegated to the lower levels never have the opportunity to access more sophisticated content and vocabulary it's really hard to see how they're going to move up. And in fact, research has shown they don't. I mean, it really doesn't work, this system. It's interesting because just the, the actual, the way the materials are arranged is organized very clearly by the complexity of the text. That's a skill rather than an organization of the content. So this might make sense in reading, but certainly there are other subject-specific areas, science, social studies, where the content must be organized by content. Am I wrong? No, you're right. Except there are a couple of problems with that, which is even if the schedule says, as in here in D.C., the D.C. public schools schedule says kids will spend 45 minutes a day on either social studies or science. But if you go into classrooms, you find that often is not happening and there's no way to ensure that that's happening. And when teachers and administrators are looking at test scores and thinking that they need to teach these skills that are being tested on the tests, what happens is they decide, well, reading and math has to take priority. And I know this from, it's not just traditional public school systems. I mean, this happens in charter schools, too. So, for example, in one of the classrooms I followed through a school year, I kept trying to observe social studies, but I missed the one time the teacher spent half an hour, an hour on it. That's one problem. And then the school, she was told by the administrators, we have to get test scores up, no more social studies or science for the foreseeable future. So that tends to happen. The other problem with social studies in particular, well, really with both, is, and this predates testing, but especially in the lower elementary grades, social studies tends to be extremely superficial. It is thought that history is a developmentally inappropriate topic for kids below maybe fourth grade. And so you get a lot of time spent on things like all about me or me and my community, community helpers, basically pretty banal stuff. And science has not been cut quite as much as social studies, but it is also thought that the only kind of science that kids are going to be able to grasp is hands-on experiments, which are often disconnected, and who knows how much kids are really taking away from them. And the general idea is that young children cannot grasp abstractions and that telling them about historical topics or about scientific discoveries, they wouldn't be interested in it and they wouldn't be able to grasp it. But there is no evidence behind that. And I have seen, I've been in classrooms where kids have been fascinated by stories or narratives that convey a lot of information about history and science. I just want to jump in there, too, to reinforce what Natalie is saying, that when you compare a really wonderful, rich knowledge-rich curriculum in ELA with one that's skills-based, you do find quite a bit of information about history and about science. And, you know, some of the ones that our institute has evaluated are certainly very strong with this. I think part of what we've lost is the deeper questions that can enliven a classroom, the questions about, you know, the really eternal questions about meaning and death appropriate authority and individualism, all of those that children are very curious about, even at a really young age. And an excellent curriculum can open up some of those richer questions if we help our teachers do it. And I don't want to forget this professional development point. There's a lot of research that even a wonderful, knowledge-rich curriculum that's not supported by rigorous PD that helps teachers deliver it, the instinct is that children can't handle this rich content. 
and 40% of teachers water it down unintentionally. I'm curious about this. So let me ask a little bit about the context because teachers are complicit as they are delivering this instruction. I'm wondering why. I generally think of teachers as professionals, well-meaning. Why would they be engaged in, you know, sort of dumbing down expectations. We've been talking about high expectations for decades. Well, I think that gets back to the knowledge gap that teachers themselves have had. And this is the virtuous circle that in a high performing school system that's knowledge rich all the way through, you have teachers who've experienced that themselves. And we now have these, these, you know, we have teachers who are, have been rightfully taught recently to focus on standards that's following their protocols, but they haven't themselves enjoyed that kind of approach to literature, for example. And, you know, the bias is, well, my child, my children can't engage in a Socratic seminar. And it just, requ- it's a learned behavior. I would also say, I mean, a lot of this has to do with teacher training. There's a big gulf between what schools of education are teaching and what cognitive psychologists on the other side of campus know about the learning process. It goes back to the roots of schools of education. There's they've been on different tracks, these two aspects of academia. You know, at the same time that teachers may be saying, oh, my kids can't handle a Socratic seminar, they are also taught in schools of education that it is better to focus on higher order aspects of thinking. So lower order aspects are defined as things like comprehension and knowledge. Higher order aspects are synthesis and analysis. Now, that is a scheme that was developed by somebody named Benjamin Bloomberg. And what he meant was you cannot engage in analysis until you actually understand. You have to go through the phase of comprehension before you can get to... It's like a staircase. It's not like jumping to the top of the ladder, right? Right. But it is presented as a pyramid. And teachers often assume we don't want to waste time on those lower order things like comprehension. Let's just jump to those metacognitive things and those higher order skills. And so you get, even though they think that history is too complex and abstract for young children, they try to teach things like the abstract distinction between a caption and a subtitle or having kids really become familiar with the concept of schema sometimes, which are incredibly abstract things that kids really have no interest in learning. I mean, this one second first grade classroom, it seemed like every time I went, the teacher was asking the kids again, now, what's the difference between the genre of fiction and nonfiction? And is fantasy a subgenre of fiction or nonfiction? And the kids could never remember the difference. But the kids in the knowledge building classroom, I mean, they knew if you ask them, well, was that tale about Paul Bunyan? Was that true? And they'd say, oh, no, that was an exaggeration, which was one of the many vocabulary words they were picking up along the way. It's a complete point of irony that on the one hand, social studies and science may not be developed mentally appropriate for kids in third grade and below, but understanding the different schema or categories of fiction is a much more appropriate fertile land for teaching. Yes, it's one of many ironies I encounter in the education system. One of the things that comes up when we look at the history of teacher training is that, again, in the English-speaking countries until the 20th, early 20th century, the two things that teachers had to know were academic content and classroom management. They had to know their content inside and out. They had to have practiced apprenticeships. And in the early 20th century, schools of education trying to professionalize teaching, the teaching force focused on developmental psychology instead. So you have whatever teachers in their training period not focusing on content, remember not having gotten it in K through 12 any longer, they're focusing on child development questions. And so there is, as Natalie said, there's this disconnect between how teachers are prepared and what a knowledge-rich curriculum really demands. And I would add that a lot of what they learn about developmental psychology, if you asked a cognitive psychologist or an academic psychologist about it, they would say, well, yes, that's good as intellectual history, but it's been substantially modified by more recent research. And yet it's being taught as gospel in schools of education. So as a former teacher, I was emergency certified, so I get this excuse, (laughs) but I certainly felt unprepared. I did not have the sort of tools at hand to deliver instruction confidently because I was trying to figure it out as I went along a lot of the way. 
even teachers who've gotten training often feel that well, way. Well, <laughs> I mean, that's my question, right? If there's not sort of a clear scaffolded content for sort of some of these things that we are expecting kids to know, it makes it difficult to understand whether teachers actually have the tools to know where they should be going and how they should be doing it. So one of the things that many teachers come from teacher prep programs believing is that a good teacher creates their own curriculum. And so when we look at, we actually, our institute does quite a bit of teacher surveys on their material use using a RAND Corporation's initial panel of American Teachers Panel in 2015. And we find that teachers do spend an inordinate amount of time self-selecting materials, often online. Teachers pay teachers, Google and Pinterest are the top three sites that they go to. And so what we find is even if an individual teacher can design a content-rich curriculum, which we have no confidence that that's happening, but even if they do, Imagine a child from classroom to classroom, year to year, a child who moves across a district. What are the odds that they're getting a coherent knowledge build? It's very small. And a lot of those materials online are really searchable by skills. You know, so, oh, you're going to be teaching main idea? Here's some things you can do. I would add, though, in contrast to most developed countries, we do not have a national curriculum. We cannot have a national curriculum. Traditionally, education is very much a local matter. And so that makes it difficult to train teachers in any particular body of knowledge because in in some countries you might know, well, oh, you're going to be teaching third grade, you're going to be teaching westward expansion or whatever. We don't have that. But there is a lot that can be done at the state and district levels. And I would point to Louisiana as a state that has been trying some very innovative things, not mandating things, but educating the educators and creating, the state has created its own content-focused curriculum. It has also rated other content-focused curricula or other curricula in general, but giving higher ratings to the ones that actually build knowledge. And Louisiana has not been known as a state with really exciting educational outcomes, but I would watch it closely. I think it could really change. Well, Ashley, I want to hear a little bit more. Uh, Johns Hopkins, you're working, we have this knowledge gap, and you guys are working on knowledge maps in part to help districts understand what their knowledge build is. Can you talk to us about that work? Sure. So, and actually playing off of what Natalie just said, it actually came from a partnership we had with John White, who's the commissioner of education in Louisiana. He said to my colleague, David Steiner, and me, well, I hear your argument that knowledge matters. How do I know if our state-created ELA curriculum guidebooks has a coherent knowledge build or not? So we started this process of outlining what are the main domains of knowledge that an ELA curriculum could enforce or not. And we've ended up with a process and actually an extensive database that we have now and can work with that actually provides a landscape analysis for districts, for published curricula, for states. This is the, these are the domains of knowledge that your ELA curriculum reinforces, and these are the omissions. And it's, it's a really interesting view. In fact, when we, we did the, the knowledge map for Baltimore City about a year and a half ago and found huge gaps in their knowledge, especially in the knowledge that would be reinforced if everything were read and studied in the ELA curriculum, so much so that the Dr. Santalisi's put in a proposal immediately to adopt Wit and Wisdom, which is a content-rich curriculum. So the knowledge, the knowledge map in ELA, we think it's really an interesting tool, and we've been fortunate enough to partner with districts and states to do it many times. We're also standing one up in social studies. And I'll commend this to listeners, especially school leaders or, or district leaders. We'll provide a link in the show notes to that. There are heat maps that you have by subject and schedule that make it very easy to see what gets dropped off and what is not by different mm-hmm. curriculums. So that's interesting work. Well, I want to ask both of you about attempts to sort of turn this lack of a knowledge-rich curriculum around. So Natalie, can you tell me about Washoe County, Nevada? Yeah, that's an interesting sort of case study that I, I included in the book. So this was pretty much a grassroots effort to figure out how to implement the Common Core when it first came in. And authors of the literacy standards actually wanted to get away from the skills-focused approach to reading comprehension. And there is some language in the supplemental materials to the Common Core talking about how, well, if you want kids to meet these standards, you really need a coherent content-building curriculum. But very few people 
are aware of that language. And if you look at the standards themselves, they're essentially a list of, looks like a list of skills. But there was this one guy who was in the Washoe County School District Central Office who basically had some time on his hands because his job had been eliminated, but he was still getting paid. And he was just tooling around the internet and found videos and things by David Coleman, for example, who was considered to be the lead author of the Common Core Standards, saying, no, actually, it's not just a bunch of, about a bunch of skills, including some new skills like the supposed skill of reading nonfiction text. It really calls for a different approach. And what they, the first message they got was, it really calls for giving kids complex text. And, and just rather than telling them in advance what it's all about or having them make a bunch of connections between their own experience and the topic, text to self connections, just let them plunge in. And so a group of teachers got together and none of them knew what they were doing, but they thought, all right, let's try it. And to their amazement, when they gave, for example, the poem by Emma Lazarus that is on the, the Statue of Liberty to a group of fourth or fifth graders, and some of these were low-income kids. They didn't speak English at home. They may have had special education designations. This is uh, give me your, your yes, tired, you're tired, your poor, your huddled masses, learning to breathe free. And lo and behold, the kids figured out that well, it's about the Statue of Liberty, and you know, and so that was the first step was that they realized they'd been underestimating what their kids were capable of. The second step was to realize that it would be much easier for them to get meaning out of a poem like that if they actually had more background knowledge relating to the context. And so a bunch of schools in that district ended up adopting a knowledge building curriculum called Core Knowledge Language Arts that was freely available online. Unfortunately, and this is sort of the coda to the story, there wasn't a whole lot of support from the district administration for this effort. And it's it affected a number of maybe a thousand teachers in the district. So there's still stuff going on, but it's no longer supported by the school district. And so to me, the message here is you need a multi-pronged effort. You need teachers to understand what this is all about and why it's important to build knowledge, but they can't really do it and sustain it without understanding and support from the top level. Ashley, I'm curious, can you tell us a little bit about Alberta, Canada and maybe a little bit happier story on this front? <laughs> sure. So Alberta, Canada was not dissimilar from the United States in its pedagogical approach, where it had kind of leached out the content from the K-12 curriculum. And so by the 1970s, there were only two required high school graduation classes. One was history and one was English. And the history was focused on psychohistory. So why did Hitler do what he did? Not what happened in the 1930s that enabled Hitler to come to power. That so is a psycho history. Course. You get you get the point. And what happened was in the there was so much dissatisfaction with this that after many attempts that failed in the 1980s, Alberta did three things simultaneously that changed their trajectory. Number one, they expanded access to distinctive kinds of schools. So whereas they had always funded Catholic and Protestant and secular schools, they expanded to include Montessori and Inuit schools and Jewish schools and all kinds of offerings. That was the first. The second, they redistributed the property taxes so that the school funding was more equitable, which I think we could take a great lesson from. And then number three, they finally put in place a rigorous, content-rich curriculum that all students had to have access to. And this took time. But the combination of those three factors has made Alberta, Canada, one of the highest performing school systems in the world. They actually have a higher immigration rate than we do. And of course, Canada has different immigration policies than the United States. So it's not completely analogous, but their ability to equalize the end results for students has just accelerated. So I look at Alberta with great envy and with great hope for our country when you see what some states and districts and some membership organizations here are trying to do, like the Chiefs for Change and CCSSO, both have made a big emphasis on high quality curriculum. So, Natalie, you have written a volume on the knowledge gap, pushing for knowledge rich curriculum, but it's not the first one. Edie Hirsch in the 80s had a New York Times bestseller. It made quite a splash. And 30 years later, we're sitting where we're sitting. My next question is, let's say readers buy your assessment that we need a knowledge-rich curriculum in schools to improve achievement and close the achievement gap. 
Without it, we're not going to make the progress, no matter what elements we bring to the table. What stands in our way? Well, you're absolutely right. I'm not the first to make this basic argument. I think it's a combination of, you know, it hasn't been presented. It's actually a pretty complicated, abstract argument to make. And it seemed to me that the reason this has not gotten into the public conversation about education, I mean, yet there are people who've known about it, but they've basically been talking to each other. And one reason it hasn't gotten into the public conversation is that there hasn't been a narrative journalistic treatment that could engage general readers and show them scenes of classrooms and introduce them to, you know, characters, real people, but make it more like a story. And I do think with E.D. Hirsch, you know, his message was really misinterpreted and seen as he was trying to impose this particular, you know, dead white male curriculum on poor defenseless children, which was really not his intent. I think the other thing that's happened, though, I think E.D. Hirsch was extremely prescient in the last 30 years since he wrote that book. There's been a lot of cognitive science evidence that's come out about the importance of background knowledge to comprehension. And so I can draw on that. It was just really beginning to come out when he wrote Cultural Literacy. He also wrote a book called Why Knowledge Matters Mm -hmm. that looks at what happens when countries that were high performing walked away from a content rich curriculum. So chapter seven in that book talks about France, yes, which sadly moved away from content and towards a skills-based curriculum. And it's had particularly bad results for the lowest income children in the country. And that, although it wasn't an intentional controlled experiment, it was interesting because it was just the elementary level curriculum that they changed in France. Everything else stayed the same. So I think that speaks to the power of what we do in elementary school, which, you know, one of the big problems here is education reformers and policymakers have seen elementary school as the bright spot in our education system and high school as the real problem. That's where the focus has been. What can we do about high school? Well, the problems that become so painfully apparent in high school do not begin there. They begin in elementary school or before, but Really, we we are wasting so much time and precious opportunity in elementary school, and we haven't been making the connection between that and what happens later. So let me throw out a couple of things that have been sort of, you know, part of the, the winds of education reform over the past. And you can pass or you can give me a quick response on how you think this affects the knowledge rich curriculum possibilities. Common Core. Well, Common Core is complicated. As I mentioned, it really, the intent was to get away from this skills-focused approach to comprehension and and really to get schools to shift to content and adopt content-focused curricula. In some places, as in Washoe County in Nevada, that did happen in Louisiana and New York to some extent. But it seems from the evidence that's available that in most places, that message did not come through. The messages that did come through was, we need to expose kids to more complex text and more nonfiction. But what's happened is you've had the marriage of the skills-focused approach with that more complex text and more nonfiction. And that is a disaster because background knowledge is even more crucial to understanding nonfiction and complex text than to simple fiction. You've got the development. If you search the internet, you'll find these new nonfiction or common core reading skills like Close reading of complex text as a sort of skill you can teach directly, doesn't really matter what the text is or or how much background knowledge kids have. So in some ways, the Common Core, I would say, completely unintentionally and through a misinterpretation, has made a bad situation worse. So not by intention, but sort of the way it's played out. Yes. Ashley? I would say on Common Core, it's necessary but insufficient. So I think standards are wonderful. I think that in math, because in math, the conceptual learning and in math skills are very similar to the content that one has to know. I would say math, it's been a win-win. Primarily ELA, it's necessary, but insufficient. Personalized learning. Ah, I'll take this. (laughs) I'm somewhat skeptical of personalized learning. I think we have to approach it with great care. This idea that you focus initially on the interests of the child and that you reinforce what the child finds interesting in the curriculum and let them develop their own playlist and so forth, that may work for very well-resourced kids who have a lot of background knowledge, as Natalie has said. But I think when it's superimposed on this bias towards skills, it could potentially work against 
high quality instruction and experience, and it could end up exacerbating the knowledge gaps and the achievement gaps that we have. So I would say it all depends. I would agree with that. And I would add that personalized learning is a mushy term. And so it means different things to different people. It is. When you figure out what it is, please tell me. <laughs> oh, don't hold your breath. But if it means that all kids are, or students are accessing basically the same content, but in different ways, perhaps. So you might have one kid write a sentence about the Civil War, and another kid write a paragraph, and another kid write an essay. That could you could consider to be personalized learning, but they're all accessing the same content. The other thing I'd say about personalized learning is it's often married to technology. Is that this, you know, put a kid in front of a computer and personalize the software, and each child will progress at his or her own pace. And the problem with that, one problem, is what's in the software? You know, what is the content? It's a delivery system, this technology. And so if we have clearly defined content, as in math or, you know, having kids practice foundational skills, you know, like decoding, phonics, it could work for that. But for almost everything else, I mean, you know, if you've got sort of mass produced software and we don't have the content to attach it to, what you usually get is that it's attached to these same old reading comprehension skills and the kids are practicing these largely meaningless skills, but they're just doing it at a computer. So, and this is separate from the Common Core, but just the ascendancy of standardized tests in education. Any relation? I think tests are important to elevate our knowledge of the achievement gaps and to focus on that issue, which is huge. I also wish that more assessments were similar to what they have in Europe and in most high-performing countries where the assessments are actually content-rich and reflect what, what the body of knowledge that students are supposed to learn. And there are just two quick things. First of all, the exit exams that are knowledge rich do have a great way of equalizing the agency of teachers and students. In this country, assessments end up being all about teacher performance at the end of the day or school performance. Whereas when students really have to learn something in preparation, it makes them agents and responsible, which I think works well. I also think we have to look at what Louisiana is doing, where they're actually trying to marry their assessment pilot to the guidebooks curriculum, which 80% of their teachers use. And it's really exciting. And I think everyone should be paying attention to that. Yeah, I would add to that. I was going to mention Louisiana. I think it's very hard to get the message across to teachers if they want their kids to do well on tests, ultimately, and in high school and beyond, that they need to focus on content rather than skills when, in some cases, certainly their schools are being evaluated on test scores and sometimes teachers are being evaluated on test scores. So I, for example, have talked to a teacher here in D.C. who was supposed to be teaching both English language arts and social studies. But even when she taught social studies, she said she really focused on those skills that they would need to do well on the tests. That was in her mind. She said they're not going to be asked about sedimentary rock or where the Navajo resided. So that's not what they're going to need for the test. The wonderful thing about what Louisiana is doing is that instead of testing kids on reading passages that are on random topics that are not designed to have anything to do with what they're learning in school, so you're basically testing them on knowledge they happen to pick up one way or another, you're going to actually assess their comprehension on topics they've had a chance to learn about. And it provides, you know, not only a fairer way of, of measuring how much progress students have made, but also an incentive for teachers to focus on the content because they know it is going to matter on the test. How much of this project of enriching curriculum with knowledge has to do with the water we swim in, as you say in the book. The reason I ask is I just threw out several different things and how does that interact with a knowledge-rich curriculum? And a lot of the answers were, well, you know, it sort of depends on how this these things are processed. It depends on how personalized learning is processed and how it's done. Well, a lot of the things that shape how Common Core played out and how tests are applied are the standards of practice that are handed down in teacher prep programs and what teachers are used to doing. So I wonder how much of this is a job of converting teachers. I think it's absolutely a job of converting teachers. I don't think we can wait for teacher training institutions and schools of education to change. I hope that will happen eventually, but certainly it's going to be a long process. And I think the good news is that there is a lot that teachers can learn on the job. 
they can learn a lot about history, for example, from a good curriculum along with their students. Might be a little rough the first year or two, but by the third year, you get confident and you can make it your own. And I think there are lots of teachers out there who have the sense that what they've been doing has not been working, but they have not, because it's the water they've been swimming in and they're surrounded by it, they really haven't known what else to do. And when they are introduced to these ideas that, hey, it is important to actually build kids' knowledge, many teachers will embrace it with two hands. I would second that. We've just finished up some curriculum audits in 11 districts in Massachusetts, and the superintendents and the principals are fascinated and enlivened by this conversation. They, Many of them went into teaching because they love, say, literature and they love history. And being, being given the yes to that is refreshing for many of them. So I, I have real hope. Yeah. And I, I've talked to coaches and, and people who've worked in schools who, and teachers themselves who say, you know, it was not an easy transition to this new way of teaching, but there's no way I would go back to what I was doing before. Let me ask you one last question before we run out of time. If teachers and administrators and folks can get excited about this, I wonder, are kids just not really engaged by a knowledge-rich curriculum? I mean, are teachers who are saying, well, you know, it's not quite developmentally appropriate. I don't want to bore my kids with drill and kill, that sort of thing. Is that what we should expect from a knowledge-rich curriculum? Oh, yes. They enjoy it from what I've seen in, in really all of the classrooms I've been in, you know, where I've been able to compare. Kids are far more engaged by a knowledge-building, content-rich curriculum than by this practice of these empty skills. Kids love learning stuff. It doesn't really matter what the stuff is, as long as it's engagingly presented. Especially young children, they love to feel that they're experts. They like to show off their knowledge. And one thing we haven't touched on is what this can do for kids' self-image and self-esteem. You know, a lot of kids, especially the struggling readers, you're telling them, just do this and you will become a better reader. And when it doesn't work, they often have no one to blame but themselves. And they're in the, you know, what they think of as the dumb reading group. When you give all kids access to interesting, complicated, meaty stuff, you have these incredibly rich discussions. And the kids Teachers have told me over and over again, it's the, the kids who would have been considered the lower level readers who often make the most perceptive contributions to class discussion, become leaders, and can feel that they too are smart, which they are. This is also true for English language learners, that often they are given lower quality materials that are deemed easy enough for them. But when they're also given the chance to engage in rich conversations, and actually comment on art and music and actually engage, their abilities in, the, in English expand. Now, I'm fascinated by this, and I think we need more research on this. Yeah, I agree. But students love it. Natalie Wexler, Ashley Berner, thanks for coming on the report card. It's a fascinating book. I commend it to folks who read it, and it's quite readable. And marrying those two things together is a great accomplishment. Thank you. The book's The Knowledge Gap. Thanks for listening to The Report Card with Nat Malkus, and special thanks to our guests, Natalie Wexler and Ashley Berner. This episode wouldn't be possible without our team of producers. That includes Sophia Gallo, Tyler Hoover, Hannah Warren, and Gage Hurley of Liquid Media. If you like today's episode, take a moment right now and subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Google, Stitcher, or your favorite podcast player. And while you're there, leave us a review so other folks can find the show. If you have any comments, questions, or topic suggestions for future episodes, reach out to us at ed.podcast at AEI.org. Until next time, I'm Nat Malkus. 